This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. Learn more at IndieFilmHustle.tv. I'd like to welcome to the show Martin Villeneuve. How are you, my friend? I'm pretty good, and you? I'm good. As, as good as we can be locked down in, in COVID world and, and, uh, and dealing with all the craziness that the world is doing, but... We're hanging in there. And, you know, as filmmakers, we still talk about film. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. So thank you for being on the show. Um, you have a fairly incredible story about your, your film, um, Mars and April. But uh, first, before we get into that, how did you get into the business in the first place? Uh, through writing and advertising. So okay. two things that, you know, have similarities with cinema, but that are not filmmaking per se, but that are school in itself. So I'm, I'm uh, really a, a writer, first and foremost. I, I started off writing uh, three graphic novels. Um, two of them uh, were the inspiration for the, the feature film, uh, Marseille Avril. Um, they were uh, photo novels. Uh, so while I was studying cinema and graphic design and working in advertising, I, I did those those books, which which, you know, kind of were successful in the sense that you know, it was not a huge print, but it, they, they got good reviews and uh, attracted some some talent. I had the uh, you know the privilege of working with uh, uh, such big names as, as Robert Lepage, which was one of our top uh, you know stage directors and actor, and uh, he accepted to to uh, play in my in my in my books at that, at that time. They were books, and Robert came up with the idea of uh, turning turning them into a feature film. Because he thought that if, if we were to combine both graphic novels, it would it would be uh, you know the meat of the movie and the, the vision behind it. Everything was there to to make a, a great sci-fi movie. Now, so, with um with the with the graphic novels, did you self-distribute them or did you have a distri- a, a publisher? I, I did have a publisher, um, La Pastec from Montreal, which mm-hmm. is p- pretty much our best uh, publisher here in terms of graphic novels. It, mm-hmm. it became quite big in the the recent years. Uh, some of their graphic novels have been turned into into other feature films as well. Um, and my my friend Frédéric Gauthier is the publisher, so uh, it's all family. You know, Montreal is quite okay. a, a small place. You know, when people ask why 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 is it so creative in Montreal, that's one of the reasons. You know, it's it's small, it's a small town, and everybody knows everyone. Fantastic. So then you so you really so you release these graphic novels. They do fairly well, um, and you decide to make a movie out of it, which I know a lot of. Uh, people who make graphic novels would love to do a film about their yeah. graphic novel, especially a sci-fi epic kind of what you've done. Um, but your bu- your budget on the film is still substantial. It's not a small um, in the it's not a small independent film, but it is regarding the scope of what you're trying to do. That's correct. That's correct. It was 2.3 million uh, Canadian, so uh, a little bit short of 2 million US, um, which, did, which is which is. How did you get? The, how did if you don't mind me asking, how did you raise that money? Uh, it it took a long time. I, I knocked in a, on a lot of doors to to get it financed uh, because obviously it's uh, you know sci-fi is not a thing in Quebec at all. Like it, it's probably the first true sci-fi movie that uh, was ever produced in in Quebec and it's not a, a sci-fi in the tradition of you know the Star Trek and the likes you know it's it's it has nothing to do with laser swords or you know like uh, <laughs> girls with big boobs and and you know like the, the 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 things we're used to to associate with sci-fi I wanted to play with those codes but in a in hopefully a different way mm-hmm. um, so it appealed to to a lot of people um, but also it's it's a very specific movie so to to finance it was was kind of a challenge <clears throat> I went to uh, Sodec and Telefilm which are Canadian funding agencies and, and they welcomed the project so that that on board uh, facilitated me going out to uh, private uh, sponsors you know and and uh, s- some private equity to, uh, to to complete the financing I was I started off with the movie with only half of the budget, which, which I don't recommend <laughs> to anyone uh, oh, so, to do. So you launched, you launched with half the budget. I, I started off with one, only 1. 1.2 million, mm-hmm. um, which was enough to, to get the movie shot, but not enough to finish, to finish it. So, uh, after completing the editing, I had to refinance for the, the, the most, uh, difficult part of the, of the process, which was getting those VFX made because there was 500 and, 
50 VFX shots in this movie. The Canadian record before that was like 125 shots. So it was more like than five times what, what had been done. Well, can you uh, so so let's back up for a second. Can you tell us a little bit about the story because I know the story and I understand what the scope is. But can you explain to the audience what uh, I, I'm saying? Mars of Mars in April because I, I don't want to massacre because I don't yeah, speak yeah, French. Yeah. Um, but what That's the story what the story is about? What kind of scope it is and what you were tr really trying to achieve with this film? Um, it's it's a poetic story, you know. It's a it's about uh, the the myth of creation, <laughs> you know. And, so small, and small, it's, small it's, indie, very introspective. Got it. <laughs> yeah, well, kind of. But it, it, it's set in, in futuristic Montreal, and, and it's a, it's at the core is a love story. So, the, but it's not a, a usual love story in the sense that that the the hero is a seventy five year old virgin uh, jazz man musician, super popular. That's uh, that people associate with um, with some sort of uh, charisma and a, and a strong sense of seduction. Mm -hmm. And uh, but the thing is, he has never made love in his life. He has never met a true uh, his true love. And uh, this this muse, uh, which uh, has served as the model for one of his musical instruments, he, uh, he falls in love with her, um, and she ends up on Mars. So it's you know like it's and he has to to go get her where she originates, you know, which is a fantasy world that originates from, from music and from uh, an internal world. So it's, it's, um, it seems like a complex pitch, but it's actually a very fairly easy story to get in as long as you accept those codes and are willing to go for the ride in, in, in an immersive world that deals with music and creation and space and cosmos and the, our place in the universe and and the language of, of creation. So, um, it's a, you know, it's pretty, it sounds fairly ambitious. It is. It, it was an ambitious story, which I would never got into if it wasn't from Robert Lepage, you know, my, my friend Robert who plays a hologram mm -hmm. in the movie. He's the guy with the holographic head. If you've seen my Ted talk, that was mm -hmm. the highlight of my Ted talk. You know, when I explain how I, I, I got to this part, Robert is a very, very busy man. And at first he was supposed to direct and produce the movie. And I was supposed to, only write it but um you know life being life you know like he had to shut down his cinema company and to, back that was well, a while ago that was back in 2007 uh he he himself wasn't able to raise financing for his own movies whereas he's our one of our biggest creator if not the biggest creator in, in canada so it tells you how hard it is to, to get financing from mm -hmm. the canadian uh, agencies. So, so Robert shut down his company and to make a long story short, he really encouraged me to continue on. And, and he said, it's your baby. You should direct it. I'll help you. I'll play in the movie. I'll, I'll help you produce it. And, um, yeah, the, the rest is history, I guess. So, so, so let's, can you talk a little bit about that as far as how you got that? Because in, you know, in, in your world and your audience that you were trying to target, he's a very, very well-known um, figure in in acting and also in directing and in filmmaking in general up up in in Canada, so he's extremely busy. So I'm sure every filmmaker out there wants an actor who's extremely busy uh, and can't like you know do anything. How was your creative workaround? Can you explain the process of the creative workaround and how you were able to get him into your film in a very creative way? Yeah, that was kind of a crazy thing uh, because Robert announced announced me when I was finally ready to shoot the movie. He said, "Martin, unfortunately, I have I'm directing three operas. I'm doing a Cirque du Soleil show. I, I play in eight movies. I, I do all these things. I I can't do your movie, you know." Like, and I was devastated because he was the reason, uh, you know, like the, he he was the, the the encouragement in the first place. So I was like, I cannot do this movie without you, Robert. And I woke up one morning. God knows how how these ideas come come to you, right? We we never quite exactly know what I. It's a mix of of many many things, but I I said, what if we turn this character into a, a hologram? What if what if I I capture his only his head and somehow manage to turn that into a three D object? This I can do in a very short amount of time, and then I can have on set another actor who will play the body. And I can stick Robert's head on somebody else's body. And that body who's going to be on set, I can use for, you know, the whole month that, that's required for principal photography. But at least I will have Robert in my movie in a weird hybrid of virtual and real. Right. And so I saw Robert one day at the airport because he's always traveling. 
and uh, by chance he was he was in the same plane and I, I got to to pitch him the idea and I, I as I was pitching the idea he said that's fantastic but how are you going to to do that because back in the days it had never been done this is before Benjamin Button and all that, all that stuff so I, I drew <laughs> I remember drawing a circle with six cameras um, so it's it's like basically picture a, a cylinder a green cylinder and you 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 punch six holes that are at 60 degrees of you know distance of each other and you place a, a camera lens be, behind those six holes and you place the subject in the middle so what you end up having is a head that hides all the cameras to to each other facing each other and you, you are able to to capture 60 degrees so, so 360 degrees of that object which is a head a talking head and you dress that person in green and you end up having a hologram at that point i, I didn't have the, the technology to create the hologram that that came another <laughs> nightmare later uh for for my vfx supervisor but at yeah. least i had the device which, yeah. which i which i i modeled in 3d and that i i, I manufactured myself and that uh, with the dop and all we we built that thing and this is the very first thing we shot for the movie so because Robert was super interested as soon as I, I said those things he said yeah I'm in I'm in so now we had to do it you know so uh, we built the, the machine and Robert showed up and it took three days uh, to shoot all, all his, his character for the movie and the, the trick because now of course like if you shoot that first um, that means you have a head but you don't have the body language but the, the head still needs to look real in the movie you know in right. interaction with all the other actors which weren't there he was mm -hmm. in a totally 3D uh, environment, completely um, abstract, and you know, yeah. it was a very experimental thing. But Robert comes from theater; he comes from improvisation and acting from nothing. So him, he was like a, a fish in the, in the water. In the, you mm -hmm. know, he was he was in his element. He could create and manage to create, but he was like Martin. I need to look at the right place. So fortunately, I had spent a year and a half way before that to drawing my whole movie. So I knew, only I knew because of my drawings where he should be looking. So I was directing his look with the laser beam mm -hmm. within the cylinder and saying, you know, there's a character there. And I was playing the other characters. Right. And, uh, and, and, and Robert did, did all his character like that, being a, the genius that he is and being able to picture in his mind that six months, a year later, somebody else would, would portray his body and that it would all need to, to look uh, seamless. You know, in, in an ideal world, we would have done that in reverse. We, you know, we would have shot the movie with right. the, the body and then do Robert after to match whatever we had shot. But that's not how we did it. We, we did it uh, in the other uh, in the other direction. <laughs> you, so you you were really on the on the tightrope here uh, on on this film. You were like you were ju you were just jumping off and praying that there was a net somewhere <laughs> that that would appear when you needed it because yeah. you as you just said i've been in post for 20 odd years and i've done visual effects loop and all that stuff so i i understand everything you're talking about but and i've done this too by the way i've went early on when i've shot my films we'll figure it out in post which is a horrible thing yeah. to say if you're doing it though you can say it but you kind of take the leap and i've been at that place in my in a, in a project where you're like if this visual effect doesn't work the whole film falls like it that, that's correct right but you you could you could have said that in my movie about everything you know, right. like if the acting fails everything falls apart if if the music is not just right everything falls apart everything uh, relied on on people doing their very best and it was my first feature on top of things and i i and i, I wrote directed and produced the the whole thing uh, it was it was very abstract and difficult we didn't have previs uh, you know, like people have now, which means that, uh, you know, if, if you look in the, in the camera nowadays, you know, the director on big budget films, he's, he's able to see what, you know, a, a, cr a crude version of what it is it's, it's going to be in the, the final movie. But me, it was all in our head. So everybody had to rely on their imagination, uh, which turned out to be great. And you know what, like I always tried throughout this process uh, of not seeing the obstacles as, as you know, something that turned me down. I always tried to use those obstacles as a creative tool to make the movie better. Because in the end, one of the things that people remember the most is that holographic head, you know, which even <laughs> uh, Ryan Johnson did put in, in Star Wars uh, episode eight, you know, like in the cantina 
sequence, yeah. you see it. You see a character that's, that looks exactly like Robert Lepage in my movie. And Kathleen Kennedy was there when I, I did my TED Talk. So I can't help but think that, you know, they, 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 they did a little nod to, to my movie. It would be, uh, it would be very hard to, to think that it's, uh, it's just a coincidence because it, it, it's exactly the same thing. So it's, it's, a, it's one of those things that people um, remember from the movie. And it, it, it was born out of a, a problem. You know, I couldn't get my actor. Well, can you also tell everybody how long you worked on this film? We haven't mentioned that. Uh, it took, in all of my 20s, basically. It, it took seven <laughs> years just Jesus. to do the... Yeah, well, you know, it took seven years to do the movie, which isn't that that uh, longer than uh, any movie. You know, all of my friends who are filmmakers, they, you know, when the movie is over, people always think that uh, it, it took a year or two to, to do. But uh, most of the time, people will tell you, I started off this project like 10 years ago, you know. Um, and, uh, but the books before that, uh, took, uh, like three, four years each. So, so in total, you know, like, uh, it was like a decade, like I started in my early twenties and it's in my early thirties that, uh, the movie finally got out. So, uh, it, it was a long process, but, uh, always very interesting. And it was a big learning experience. So, so you, you made a movie for about $2.3 million, but generally it, it looks like a twenty or thirty million dollar film, if not bigger. And that's correct. That's that's uh, that's why, in in the first place, uh, Chris Anderson invited me to TED because he saw my movie on the uh, on the big screen in uh, Vancouver, and uh, he approached me after because I had given a Q and A, uh, and he said, "Hi, I'm Chris Anderson," and of course I knew who he was. You know, he's the TED guru, and uh, he said, "You know, how much did you say the budget was like?" 23 million i said no no it's, it was 2.3 10 percent of of what he thought so he said that's that's absolutely incredible he said you have to come on the ted stage and, and tell us how you did it because he, he said it, it looks so much bigger than it is so i think the the ambitions that it's it's far from being a perfect film but what i'm saying is the the ambition that fueled the project had legs and, and uh, a lot of, of people embraced it and, and gave it their all. And I had like amazing, amazing uh, people working on the movie, like super talented people that chose to devote some of their talent and, and time to the, to the movie, uh, whereas there was, there was very little money, you know, uh, right. to, to pay them or to, or to make. So what I found, what I found in my, in my journeys, because uh, I, I did, I, I've done some ambitious visual effects action films in my in my early career, and I had no money. So I've this, and I think you you mentioned this in TED in your TED talk, where when you don't have money, you have to give something else. And I, when I was creating, I created a spectacle, I created an event, I created a, like we're going to achieve something here that's bigger than we're going to try to do stuff that hasn't been done before. Um, and we're going to allow you to play and we're going to give you freedom. And that's the, the currency of an independent filmmaker with, uh, with this kind of project is where you're now challenging them to do something they haven't done before to stretch their, 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 their wings out a bit. And I have guys who've worked on big giant, you know, star Wars and bond and all these big movies. But when I call them, they're like, yeah, I want to do your project because I'm really excited about doing something I haven't done before. Did you find that to be true on your end? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, this, this, I've always pitched this movie as being a lab. Uh, I, I, I told everybody who, who got involved that it would be a place of creation and experiment and some place where they, they could be uh, to go back the, to the aquarium analogy, you know, where there would be a, a big fish in a small aquarium, you know, <laughs> because, you know, when I, when I approach one of my childhood heroes, Francois Caton, he's a, he's a huge comic book artist, uh, from Belgium. Um, and I grew up on his, on his graphic novels, you know, uh, they're huge for me. Uh, and he was a huge influence already when I wrote my books. And when I approached him, uh, he said, you know, Martin, you know, most of the time, uh, when Americans, uh, American producers approach me, you know, he, he worked on uh, the Golden Compass. He worked on Mr. Nobody, you know, those, those big, big movies. He said, they, uh, they steal my stuff, you know, they, they steal my work. And yes, there's a big paycheck at the end of the day, but I have no fun, you know, uh, working 
uh, like that on big productions because I don't feel uh, that my voice makes a, a big difference in the end, you know. Whereas he said on a smaller movie like like yours, uh, I can I can explore, I can experiment, I can develop a language, uh, and which he did. So for for five years, he, he and I drew Montreal in the future together, you know, like I come from the graphic world. So for me to work with Francois Caton for five years, imagine it was like oh my a God, dream yeah. come true. It's like working yeah, with Spielberg so, so or Nolan have... or Fincher for like five yeah. years. <laughs> exactly. And it was like a ping pong game and he would invite me to, to his place in Brussels and he would come to Montreal. And so it, it took a long time. So it's, so time is, is a currency, you know, when you don't have money, you must take time. That's one of the things I say in my TED talk. And that cannot be more true for Marce Avril because, <clears throat> you know, like the, for the composer, for, for instance, you know, I approached, uh, an Oscar nominated composer who had done the, the triplets of Belleville, you know, Benoit yeah. Charest is our yeah. best Canadian composer. And, uh, he said, I'm interested, you know, but how much time do you have? You know, which is the first question that big creators are asking you. Mm-hmm. And I said, how much time do you need? And he said, well, you're asking me to basically go back to Kepler's theory from the 17th century and elaborate a new take on it, which is, which is something that Gustav Holtz has done and took years, you know, like mm-hmm. worked for years on those things. He said, you don't have that luxury in cinema, you know, you have two months normally, you know, and I said, well, I can give you at least a year. It took a year and a half for him to, to do the, the music, but uh, wow. and his beard would, would grow Every time I would see Benoit, his beard would grow longer and longer and longer, and he wouldn't shave, and he was like trying to figure this out. And the music won for best album of the year in Canada. It won a Felix for best album of the year. So he did a fantastic job. And, and you know, the music on this movie was as important as the VFX, as important as the script, as important as the actors and the sets and all that stuff. It, it was a key component. So we had to to get this right. <laughs> so you, um, so th- that's, uh, that's amazing. Cause I, uh, again, when working with high end people who normally get paid a lot of money, you have to give them freedom. You've got to give them creativity, creative freedom, collaboration at, at a level that you don't get normally. And to get an Oscar nominated composer to come on board, um, to work on it. And then also having that amazing artist as well, come on board. Can you, can you dig a little bit deeper into, the, in, into how he and you created this world? Cause I saw that you did a lot of map paintings as bases. Mm-hmm. And then from the bases, then you animated elements in it. So, so you were doing old school map paintings, but with some new, uh, new world effects, like, you know, water moving or lights blinking or things like that. Correct. Yeah. So, so basically when, when you do such a thing, it's like, uh, it's like a puzzle, you know, like, uh, you're a filmmaker, so you know what I'm talking about. Like you, you, you shoot one element and you know that this element is going to fit in a bigger element and that this bigger element will need this and that to make, to make a final image that, that works. So you plan, you plan all of that ahead, you know, so that when you come on set, it's pure execution. Uh, because I, I only had 22 days, you know, to shoot this film, which is a huge, huge challenge. Yeah. You know, most people would take 80, 90 days to, to shoot a movie like that. So, uh, you know, and I, I, I regret that a bit now because I, you know, like I wish I had more time, but when you Always. don't have a lot of money, uh, you know, the, the problem now I said, I said earlier that you need to give people more time, but the reality of cinema is that it costs so much when you get to shooting that the less time, the, the better. So you have to be super prepared. Like preparation is really the key. So I, I as I mentioned, I I storyboarded the thousand two hundred st- storyboards. You know, like that I I I did myself. A few of my friends did help, but I you know I didn't have any money for that that stage. So I you know the more you can do by yourself, the better it is. Because then again, you 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 have to picture the whole movie in your mind and, mm-hmm. and get the whole thing in your mind so that when you come to set, you know exactly what pieces of the puzzle you need to get for the final image to work. So when I worked with Francois Caetan, I, I came again, highly prepared. I had done my homeworks, you know, like uh, years of research and he had asked me uh, to come up with uh, concepts from, for Montreal of the future. So it, it's, you know, when you, when you come to a big designer like that, uh, like, I don't know when, when Sid Mead did, did the Blade Runner, you know, it's 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 not just Ridley Scott coming and say, here, design me Los Angeles in 2049 or in 2019. Uh, 
it's it's um, it's much more complex than that. It it it, it requires the, the director to come with a lot of references. And yeah. the, if you can draw yourself, that's even better because you're talking abstraction and the clearer it gets, the better it gets on, on, on the screen, you know? So I, fortunately I can draw and I, 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 we use drawing as a tool. Francois and I sat together and I had tons of references and uh, we, we would just uh, look at stuff that, that were real things, real, real projects, utopian projects that had been uh, you know, conceived in the in the past for Montreal, and that that do exist, like uh, Habitat 67, which is a beautiful piece uh, by Moshe Savdi, uh, the Biosphere by uh, Buckminster Fuller. Mm -hmm. Those are things from Expo 67, and um, we did contact Moshe Savdi and ask permission to to replicate his his beautiful construction, but make it a thousand times bigger. You know, and again, I, I took a risk because, you know, like I, I did create the model before I asked permission, uh, which <laughs> no, you know, no producer on a normal movie would do. But I knew he would say yes, you know, because I was working with, with Francois Caetan and because what we did was good. So why would he say no? You know, so at right. one point when we when I had a super strong 3D model of his Habitat 67, I, I reached out to him, to his team, sent the, the pitch and he, he wrote me a, a letter uh, that he granted me permission to use it uh, within 24 hours. I had the letter, uh, but I didn't make a few insurance people uh, worry for <laughs> <laughs> at some points in the movie because I would do that all the time. You know, like it would drive people crazy. But you know, like sometimes you need to do those things. You need to provoke reality for reality to to give back to you. You know, like that's a great. Uh, and, that's a and most great, people great comment. So, well, sometimes people are afraid, you know, like they're, they're like, oh, what if he says no? But I was like, why would he say no? You know, like, why, why are you telling me that he will say no? Of course he will say yes. You know, like a, same with, you know, the biosphere was, was trickier because it's owned by Buckminster Fuller's succession and it's, it's owned by bureaucrats now. It's uh, Environnement Canada. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I went to them a few years prior to shooting the movie and I asked for the 3D schematics like the, the original schematics of the biosphere. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not 3D, it was 2D, but I, I needed to put them in 3D to create, to recreate the biosphere mm -hmm. and shoot whatever I had to shoot in, 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 on green screen and recreate that thing and place it at the, at the top of a tower because Francois had, had, had drawn this beautiful uh, Art Deco tower and he wanted to place the, the bubble mm -hmm. at the, the very top of it. So uh, this was 3D. Uh, so I had to recreate that. And years later, I phoned back Environnement Canada and I said, come and see the shots, you know, come, come and approve the, the shots that we did uh, of the movie. And, and when they saw the, the shots, they could not believe. They, they said, when did you shoot in the biosphere exactly? We don't remember <laughs> you showing up. And I said, I didn't shoot. I, I recreated it. And I showed them the before and after with the green screen yeah. and the 3D and the just couldn't believe it. The, I had three bureaucrats there, and they, they, they got out of the room. And they were like, "Oh my God!" Like, congrats, you know. And they, they were they were very proud. So what I mean by that is, is when you have something something great, why wouldn't people embrace it? You know, like it's 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 too easy to think that people are gonna say no. Like it 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 it, it stops so many projects from getting made, and I find it sad. Yeah, I mean, it's the thing is that you have to take risks and sometimes specifically creatively what you were spending is not obscene amounts of money but time it was a lot mm -hmm. of time to create so your currency was time there so if they would have said no you would have lost time not millions of dollars so you were taking risks um but you have to you have to take those risks especially when you have an ambitious project like that i mean i've i i mean i just been there on my own project so i completely understand i took massive risks uh, and started projects when they shouldn't have started, and and just like jumped, and it's like there's something's gonna be there when I when, when I when I take my foot off and go into the into the unknown, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, yeah, but the thing is though, like uh, it seems uh, like a fluid process, but it's not. You you face like you know like great great walls. You know like sometimes you hit huge walls. I had to remortgage my house twice. Wow. Uh, it, it was a huge night, nightmare to. To refinance the movie, um, some people had to jump in at the last minute and, and save save my ass. Sorry for the expression, but sure. uh, Robert Lepage again, you know, like uh, was uh, was one of those people. You know, at the last very last minute, you know, like the 
uh, you know, the bank was after me. They were about to pull the plug on the movie. And Robert Lepage came in and he said, how much, do, how much do you need to complete your financing? And I said, I'm still a quarter of a million short. You know, it's still two, 250. It's a lot thousand. of money. You know, it's yeah. a lot of money. It's a, the, 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 it's a house. It's a, you have to remortgage your house, with, with, which I had already done twice. So there was no way I could do that. So Robert said, you know, like, I'm, I'm going to help you out. And he signed me a check of his own money for, to complete the, <sighs> the financing. So there, there was some truly, uh, some angels. angels yeah. My, yeah. Yeah. Along my path, you know, like, because if it wasn't from him, we would have never uh, finished the movie. You know? Now, there was another thing in your TED Talk I'd love you to talk about. And it's just another way. It's another example of how you approach this entire project, because I, I know there's so many uh, you know, tribe members who are listening right now who have ambitious projects, but they're scared. They're scared because it's, oh, it's just too ambitious, or I don't know enough about this, or I don't know. I'm sure you learned a lot along the way. I'm sure you did not know everything when you started um, the process. I'm assuming that's correct. Oh, I, I'm, no, I knew very little. I, well, I had studied filmmaking and graphic design in university. I had done sure. Uh, numerous like music videos, numerous, sure. uh, but nothing like this. But nothing, but like, nothing this. like this. Not, nothing prepares you to what if doing a feature film is. It's probably the hardest. I I wouldn't hesitate to say that's probably the hardest thing a creator can get involved in because it it, it requires um, yeah. so many people, so many people, and you have to deal with so many different kind of people and to, to get things right on every department and to keep your vision intact. <clears throat> and, and navigate uh, with the <clears throat> the financial reality of it, you know, like uh, the there's that. The thing. There's always uh, that, <laughs> you know, and and especially for for something like like what I wanted to do, no one had, had done that before. So it's it's not like uh, people could tell me, yeah, take that road and use those tools and go to these people to these people to, you know, there, there was no such thing. One thing we did have in Montreal that we still do have, even better now, is, is VFX artists and yeah. great, great VX, VFX companies. And this I knew. And it was a time when I did this movie uh, where VFX companies were, you know, booming. There was a they were blooming in in in, uh, in Montreal. Uh, lots of great, great creative minds coming here to work on big productions, and companies that would be willing to help you if you're not on the right door, you know, because it's, it's not always magical like that. But, uh, I went to the biggest, you know, facility we, we had in Montreal because, you know, to make such a, you know, a, a big, big number of VFX, but that little amount of money to go with it, you need uh, a team that's going to, you know, you don't split it in, in 10 different VFX companies that would be killing the, the project. You need one strong team that takes six months and just do the thing. Bangs it just out. Like operate. Yeah. yeah. So I, I showed my picture lock, the, 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 the people from that VFX company. It's called Mel's now. It was Vision Global back in the days. And they looked at what I had done. Uh, they couldn't believe I had shot this for one million. You know, they were like, "Wow, that that's really, really well, well, well achieved." And I had planned every shot. Uh, I knew exactly how it it would be completed. You know, and I had I had like ten thousand references. You know, like very well put together. Yeah, I had figured out everything. So they were like, "Oh, good." And on top of things, I had convinced Carlos Manzan, who was just out of you know. Transformers and, and Avatar and those big big movies as as a lead compo com compositor and he uh, he was uh, in agreement with the direction of the project and he wanted to contribute so I had that that card in my back pocket to to help uh, get everybody on board and uh, I got lucky you know like uh, the, there's a bit of luck but I I do think you create when you create a movement. You know, there's an energy energy mm -hmm. that that's moving forward. Uh, people people go with it because you know, like these companies, they're approached all the time to give freebies, but sometimes it's disorganized. It's not done yet. It's, it's gonna happen maybe. Yeah. Maybe I'm gonna get the money. Maybe I'm not. You know, like it's 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 a bit like uh, me. It was it was very real. You know, and I and I had gathered the the. The one I had another one, roughly one million, one point two million to complete the whole thing. They had to take the sound, they had to take the VFX, they had to take the whole thing. 
but they, they didn't make money, but they didn't lose any. You know, they kept their team because the, the, one of the challenges for big VFX companies is sometimes losing there's a the hole. You know? Yep. You, yep. you know, you lose it. There's a big US film, Harry Potter comes to town or, you know, X-Men Star Wars comes to or, town and yeah. shoot Star Wars. And then th there was supposed to be another big movie. It, it's, it's postponed for various reasons. So they have a drop of six months where they do advertising to keep their team. And the team is like, yeah, but we were promised Star Wars and we we're working on Burger King. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> yes. so, so, it, it, you know, so, so they're like, okay, so we, we have this, this great, uh, you know, creative thing, you know, it's a, uh, it's a very experimental object. It's fun. It's, it looks great. We can try stuff. We have Carlos Munzen. We have all the, these, these great artists. So let, let's do, let's, let's do it, you know? And so they, uh, they embraced it and they decided they, they put 60 VFX artists, the top, Top wow. artists in the industry. They worked full time for six months, which was very, very rewarding and fun. It was finally after the, the nightmare because it, re refinancing the movie took more than a year, you know? Sure. So, so uh, and I was alone working on that. I left my full time job in advertising. I was just focusing on getting the thing finished. And uh, after that, you know, traversé du désert, you know, after going through the desert <laughs> for, to finally get some alone, water, you, know, yeah. you finally see know, the get, oasis. Get, get to, get to Mordor with the ring, you know. Like, uh, <laughs> and just so know, everybody, under, so that everybody understand, you know, what he was able to achieve was what he was able to achieve with his VFX team is like what he's talking about is a 10 or $15 million deal. <laughs> like it 60 is. artists. I, I didn't expect 60. I didn't know. I, I thought they were going to throw maybe five or 10 guys on it. And they worked on it on their part time on the side. You had 60 artists full time for six months, that is a massive amount of manpower in the visual effects world. Massive. It is. It's, yeah. And it's very expensive. It's not cheap to do something like that. So that you were able to pull that off for under a million bucks, and that's including music and, 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 and mastering and all that other stuff, um, is, is amazing. It really is amazing. Yeah, I got I got a, a big gift, I will admit. But at the same time, uh, the the owner of that company uh, said that it was a very good investment uh, because when I did my TED talk, it got seen by millions of people. And normally, when you go on the TED stage, you're not allowed to mention company names. Sure. And I mentioned three three companies when I <laughs> when I went on that stage and they didn't cut it. That you know, it's still online. And I mentioned Cirque du Soleil. I mentioned uh, Vision Global, which helped me with the the VFX and you know, and and uh, oh, they got. I'm sure they a, got tons of press for it. They, they 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 got a lot of press, and they got a lot of phone calls, and they made a lot of movies, and they made their money back. Believe me. So it's it's you know sometimes like those projects, they they showcase. You know, they showcase uh, what you're able to do, and truly, like there are some really really great VFX shots in this movie. You know, like uh, I'm I'm very proud of some of the shots. Some some of them, you know, are very simple, mm -hmm. uh, but then again, you have to know where to invest your energy and your little, the little money you have. You need to invest it at the uh, where it's it's really re rewarding, you know. Because uh, the the problem is if you're too ambitious and that you're doing something that involves you know crazy action sequences and the likes, you're not going to finish the the movie. That's the that's the reality. Mine was a contained world, you know. It was those were not like overly complex VFX to achieve. It's the number. It's the number that was frightening. 550 VFX shots to complete. This is the, the volume that, the, that was yeah, it wasn't a trans this is why you, it wasn't a transforming robot <laughs> fighting another no, no, transforming that's it, that's robot. It. No, it was not that, that kind of thing. And it, it needed to be clever and it needed to be well done. And, and um, so a lot of brains, uh, but man, was it, was it, fun to to see it happening finally you know when i when i got to that stage it was uh, the movie was was reaching its its end at this point you know and it's it's always a great joy after so many years you know you're mm -hmm. like wow it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's finally happening it's it's getting put together and yeah yeah and the, the I, I found that too that it, a lot of times uh vfx specifically they will do a project that they feel that they can they can showcase something or do something that they haven't been able to do before and sometimes they'll do it for free sometimes they'll do it for um for cost or for very very cheap because they see the value on the back end and if you can provide them with press 
uh, which is something I've been able to do with my project since I started as a filmmaker, uh, get attention. And then once you get a track record of that, like I promise you, if the next movie you do um, and you need a lot of visual effects, there'll probably be a line of companies who would want to work with you because of what you were able to achieve. So once you're able to build up that that credibility as well, then doors open a lot easier for you. Would you agree with that? Uh, I wish it was the case. You know, I haven't shot a, a second feature film yet, but uh, and it's been eight, eight years already. You know, so I and it's not like I haven't been trying. Uh, wh what I what I do did notice is that everybody who has worked uh, either as a cinematographer, you know, VFX yeah. artist, mm -hmm. like every, everybody who was like key department on my movie uh, got a lot of jobs. You know, they Good. got offered a lot of jobs. Uh, me, in my case, it's a bit trickier because as a filmmaker, um, you're, you create your own opportunities most of the time. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it, it becomes a game of luck, you know, like you do pitches, you try to develop projects, you, you write things, you invest the same energy in every project. But it's, it's you know, it, it, luck needs to be on your side and, and timing. And, uh, you know, like for a movie, to, to all the, the components to be together and be able to allow you to do a second feature film is it's very complex and to be honest i didn't think it would be that hard i thought after doing you know my my first movie it, it, it what got shown in more than 20 uh, festivals uh, worldwide it, it won awards it, it, I, I went to ted i was the first speaker from quebec to to get on that stage it was huge you know and, and only the third filmmaker and the, the two others before me were jj abrams and, and james cameron you know and james cameron so it it, it, I thought, man, it's going to open doors for me. And it did. It did. You know, it got me into into pitches. It got me into meetings that I would never have got gotten otherwise. Uh, it got me interviewed a number of times. It got I, I did numerous pitches and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm grateful for, for those opportunities. But uh, for everything to stick together and allow you to make a second feature, it's super hard. And by the way, my brother Denis, uh, who is the, directing Dune right now, uh, huge, huge, huge film. Uh, he was nine years without shooting uh, before his second and third feature film in Quebec. Nobody would give him uh, another chance, you know. So mm -hmm. it's, it, it tells you how hard it is. And I mentioned Robert Lavage, you know, like he's probably our our greatest mind, creative mind from Canada, and he was not able to. And he did like six, seven feature film, and they they would never find him again. So so it's it's uh, it's incredibly hard, you know. I'm looking forward to see Dune. Actually, I've seen some of the the the, yeah. the, the images, and I am super excited. I'm a fan of the Lynch version. Uh, I wish Lynch would have had free reign to see what he would have really done back then. Um, but I'm really curious to see what uh, what your brother does with the film. It, it looks uh, amazing. Yeah, yeah, me too. Now, um, do you got the film distributed, right? So how did you get, did you, did you make your money back? All that? I, I did, I did. Uh, but not thanks to the Canadian distributor who didn't <laughs> believe in the movie too much. Like uh, when he saw the, the movie, I think he didn't. Yeah, I think he didn't know what to make of it because there, there was no such thing in, in Quebec that has, and they will never be again because, you know, you have to understand in Quebec we produced comedies or dramas that look towards the past, never towards the future. It, it's always about the past and it's always the same stories. And I don't mind it. I, I think there's a place for that, but it's always that. And nobody is looking at the future, which is what I wanted to do. And it was embraced by festivals around the world, uh, the US and Europe. Uh, you know, like it's, it's a, a niche kind of audience, but that could be found at a lot of places around the planet. So the movie did get, reach its, its audience, which is very fortunate um, because that is a problem, as you know. Mm -hmm. And when I, 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 I was invited to TED, it became a huge, huge, huge platform, you know, like uh, something that I could never have dreamed of. And um, when, I, when I went to the Canadian distributor uh, to, to tell them the good news, you know, that I would be the first French Canadian, first Quebecois to get on that stage, it would get millions of people to suddenly be aware of that movie. You know what his reaction was? What? He said, what is Ted? Son of a so 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 I said okay, uh, let's 
let's change the subject. So I kept my rights because I had, I had the international rights. He had the Canadian rights. So I said, keep the Canadian rights, no problem. And I went to TED. And the next day after my TED talk, I had like 15 distributors like being like, you know, like wanting to buy the rights for, for you know, like uh, more than you made for more, more than you made it yeah. for. Yeah, exactly. So in the end, it, it, it was an advantage uh, because choosing your allies in, in a battle like that is, is crucial. And me, I was I was uh, like Indiana Jones making this up as I go, you know, like I had no clue. But some, <laughs> some accidents were, you know, it's a blessing in disguise. Yeah. Because when I came back from that, 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 that uh, meeting with the Canadian distributor, I was so discouraged, you know, like I was like, man, I'm offering him the biggest you stage. know, platform mm -hmm. that that the biggest stage on earth, and it's free. And what I was asking him is to simply get an international distribution deal with Amazon and iTunes and the like, so that if people in India see my TED talk, they click on the link on, underneath and they 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 they, they can they can see Rent the movie and yeah. iTunes yeah, India, and if you're in the UK and so so on and so forth. And they didn't see it, which is now obvious. But that—that's back in 2013. Uh, so that—that's what I did myself. But but again, I had to do it myself. So I, I made those deals with all the international distributors, and the movie did make its money back within six months. You know, that's it's, amazing. It's, it's not like uh, it's not like the movie like uh, made tons of profits, but it did make its money back, which is one of the few cases where this happens in Canada, you know, like our movies very rarely make their money back. So I'm very proud because it's not only a, a creative success, but it's also, you could say a, a commercial success in, in a sense, uh, just to make its money back. And I was, I was able to write a check because all my team, you know, the hundreds of people who worked on the movie, they had to reinvest like, uh, 13%, I think it was of their salary to, to, for me to be able to, to complete it, so uh, that deferred pay, I was able to pay back to all of my team members, and it was the first time. Some some technicians told me oh, it's yeah. the first time in my life that I've worked on a movie, an independent movie, with a deferred pay, and that I see my money back. So they, I had many people write to me and say thank you so much. So, you know, like uh, it, it it was overall a very very positive uh, experience, and I'm you know I'm uh, you know it's. It's, it's what it is. You know, the movie is not perfect, but, and some people will hate it and some people think it's the greatest thing on earth. But, you know, it didn't leave anybody indifferent and it, 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 it has a voice of its own, you know, like uh, right. it's been a while now. I don't, I don't really identify to the movie anymore, but the, I can see that it's relevant. It's, it's at its place and I'm, I'm, I'm glad it got made. You know? No, it, it, your story on how you made it and what you were able to do with it is, is pretty remarkable and an inspiration to everyone listening, honestly, because you can't be afraid to take risks and, but you took calculated risks. You know, you did have a base of knowledge to fall back on. You've been in, you know, you were been working as a professional in, in the advertising space. You were a graphic designer. So there were skills. There were, as I say, tools in your toolbox that you walked into this project with. And you learned along the way, but you had a really good foundation to start off with. Uh, and then you learned as you went. So take risk, but take calculated risk. And I think that's something that you did. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and what uh, I remember, too, is, is the, the importance of network. You know, oh, like, uh, yes. Yes. because every, you know, every, even in, in advertising, this is how I met Guy La Liberté from Cirque du Soleil, who eventually helped me with the movie and, and Robert Lepage, who helped me with the movie and, and all these people, you know, I met by doing something else than cinema, which is also very important because sometimes we focus and we think like it's cinema, it's cinema. So I, I there, there's a path that I need to take, but don't never underestimate the, the other paths. You know, the other path that you may take, because that may go a long way at one point, you know, you may find out that, you know, some some contacts you made in, in that sound company like a year, a few years back may be very, very handy uh, and helpful. And that, you know, people that you've met the, in the Cirque world suddenly will help you make you make your movie. And so so that to me uh, is super important. And everything I've shot since um, Marcia Avril have been because of my networks, you know, because I, I wasn't unfortunately able to, to get uh, more money to, to shoot another feature, but I, I've done short films and I got people like the, some of the best people in the industry wanting to shoot with me again and, you know, like, and, and experiment again and do other things. And, um, so, uh, so I'm, I'm still continuing, uh, 
in, in filmmaking. And I, I have numerous, uh, uh, you know, feature films that are on the verge of, of always on the verge, paid, you know? always, yeah, on, always the verge. on the verge, like that money, we, that money is going to drop any day now. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. You know, no, but, uh, I, I, I'm really hoping that, uh, next time we speak, uh, I will be able to tell you about, uh, about uh, the exp what it was to shoot the second feature. Yeah, and and uh, what are you working on now? I have, I have like uh, six or seven projects, but um, I shot uh, uh, last fall before the, the the crisis. I shot two sequels to a short film uh, that I shot right after uh, Marseille Avril, and which was kind of a little success in in itself. You know, it, it's called Imelda, and I I, I play my own grandmother, <laughs> which uh, which may sound funny. But nice. uh, it's a character that I really, really like, and it's a very simple form of filmmaking. It doesn't require a lot of money, and I had a lot of fun doing the, that first one. And I won uh, the the award for best actor from Union des Artistes, which is the the only uh, you know award you can win in acting for a short film in in in, in Quebec. So I, you know, uh, and people were like, "What's happening after? Like, uh, we want to see more of Imelda." So I, I now I shot two sequels, and and now I had Robert Lepage for real. He's not a hologram, but he's he's co-star in the, in the <laughs> sequel, Imelda Two. I'm with Robert Lepage, and in Imelda Three, I'm with Ginette Renault, which is oh, one she... of our greatest singer and actress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? um, so she sings in the in the third one, and she plays my other grandmother, Simon. Right. That, so uh, that's it's amazing. a family history, you know. My 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 Robert Lepage play, plays my dad. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, 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 you know, I, I use my family mythology as, as, as a drama, uh, which is very fun doing. Uh, I'm also working on a, a very elegant sci-fi thriller called Joanna uh, by, you know, I, this is a pitch I won for Voltage Pictures uh, in Los Angeles last year. And uh, if all goes well, we should be shooting in November, if not, you know, in early 2021, if the Fortunately, the COVID uh, crisis is over. Mm -hmm. um, it's about androids, and uh, we have a few actors attached already, and, and financing is going well. So, but it's a, it's a small budget, you know. It's five five six million US. Uh, I'm also working on a small drama. It's a dramedy called Two Piranhas, um, hmm. and it's a, it's a great 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 script. Uh, just two actors, two older actors. A uh, few few settings, uh, very simple filmmaking, but complex at the same times because everything relies on details. So this is also uh, ready to shoot. Um, I'm working on an animated series uh, called Red Ketchup. It's based on a cult uh, comic book series here in Quebec that I grew up with. It's a crazy FBI agent uh, that's that's feeding on drugs, and it's it's completely. Uh, psychedelic uh, world it's like it's like james bond but shot by tarantino you know oh <laughs> i would watch that i would yeah. i would, I yeah, would watch that <laughs> that's why i want to do this this series so this is looking good too um i have you Aquarica. sound busy you sound busy i, I am uh, the thing is that i've been i've been uh, living out of writing you know i, I this this is why I, I could leave advertising because now producers you know, pay me. That's one of the great luxuries of, of, of Marcia Avril because it created an, another kind of network where suddenly like I, I'm getting paid to develop projects. So, um, and Aquarica is, is something that I've been writing for years. Again, I'm teaming up with Francois Caton and it's, it's an animated feature. Uh, so in the, you know, yeah. European tradition looks, looks very nice. We did the test already. Uh, and uh, finally, I'm working with uh, another childhood heroes of mine, James V. Hart. Uh, yes. Great scriptwriter. He, he wrote Dracula. Uh, Dracula. He wrote Dracula. He wrote Contact with Jolly Foster. Yeah, Remember yeah. Contact? Of course. So, uh, you know, like, I, we, He's amazing. we're writing to. Yeah, we're writing a, a big sci fi uh, drama together called Water Nova. And um, yeah, we have an amazing script. I mean, you are an absolute inspiration. Uh, Mark. <laughs> You're an inspiration, honestly. You you uh, you you personify the creative spirit, um, because just to get your movie made in seven years, that takes a level of persistence that's pretty remarkable um, in the in the artistic world in general. 
But um, you are definitely an inspiration, my friend. I'm going to ask you a few questions that I ask all my guests. Uh, what advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? Be patient. Uh, Francois Caton told me uh, many times, you know, from his experience in cinema, it's not about talent. It's about being patient and tenacious and pushing your ideas forward and always, always believing that it's going to happen. Never give up. You know, it's the, it's the, it's the clue. Every, every filmmaker that makes it had big dreams and, and they never gave up, you know. Um, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? The biggest lesson, um, I think, is not to get depressed by the fact that things aren't happening now. Because <laughs> otherwise, you know, you wouldn't do anything. That's uh, true. The, the, pro the problem with cinema is that it takes a long time. It's a long time in the making. It requires a lot of money, a lot of people. So don't get depressed if your projects don't take off right now. That's why I'm, I'm still believing in, in cinema. Uh, it's, it's because, you know, there's a timing for things. And sometimes if you're too, too early, uh, things fall flat. If you're too late, uh, things have been done before. You know, you, you need to hit that, that string and that chord where it's just the right time to tell a story. And stories want to live. You know, believe me, like Marcel Avril wanted to live beyond everybody was working on it. It's, it's not you sometimes who dictates those rules. It's, uh, it's the, the, the project itself. So you need to, uh, to believe in that. You're, you're essentially a vessel for the story to be born into this world, basically. And I feel the same way. A lot of times the story is much more powerful and the message is much more powerful than you are. Uh, it's not about you. <laughs> no, absolutely. Now, absolutely. Um, and three of your favorite films of all time. Brazil by yes. Terry Gilliam. Yes. Uh, the first Blade Runner. Uh, oh, yes. And the first Indiana Jones, I would say, probably. Uh, yes, yes. And, and of course, everybody who knows me intimately know that I'm the biggest fan of Back to the Future on the planet. <laughs> you know, like, uh, I know a lot of people will say that, but... I am the biggest fan, you know. And but I, I don't see I, a hoverboard year, anywhere. I don't see a hoverboard anywhere. No, Where is it? <laughs> but next time we speak, I'll show you my little collection. I, I, I got to meet uh, the actors last year thanks to my girlfriend. Uh -huh. um, she, uh, she introduced me to Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd and Thomas Wilson and James Token and Lee Thompson. And it was in Orlando. And it was probably one of the... The, highlights the, the, the last gathering yeah uh, and i had kept all the because when i was a, a teenager i replicated the time machine in my parents basement of course um, you did and, uh, yeah and and <laughs> and all those those letters that, that that they would exchange and all that stuff like you know the the letter from 1885 and the letter from 1955 and i back then it was a vhs so i had to pause the vhs on the tv and try to to yes. guess with the tracking the with the track with the tracking going like that <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly right. And it was a poor VHS copy, let me tell you. And um, I, my mother, thankfully, had kept some of these items so I could bring them with me. And they all signed it. And I, it was like amazing. That must be amazing. Yeah, I'm a huge Back to the Future fan. And they were talking about, what was it? They were talking about trying to reboot it. And um, Gail. I hope not. No, no, Gail, the producer. What's his name? Is it Robert Gale? No, Bob, Bob Gale. Bob Gale. Bob Gale said, not while I'm alive. Right. <laughs> it's like it's not so gonna have to kill him. <laughs> Eventually, he will die, and I I hope that his estate will not allow the sequels to happen or or anything to happen. It's done. It's it's a perfection it, it, as it, it is. Yeah, and and it's all about the actors. You know, you will never be able in the never. alien world, it, it, and even with with uh, tons of money and VFX, you will never no. be able to replicate the chemistry be between Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd. It's, yeah, it's and Zumek and Zumek is there and. And Spielberg has like got the Godfather around it. Like there's just it's just, and I just yeah, yeah, and it, 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 it's like any film, you know, it it belongs to a time, you know. It's 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 a, oh, ironic absolutely. that it's a movie about time, but it's it's really like a, about the the moment where it was made in history and the influence it got and the, the writing of it and everything about it is great, and uh, they they age pretty well, you know. Like uh, and and that is a key for me. A movie that age ages well, like Brazil or Indiana Jones or all, all yeah. those classics. Like, there's a reason why they're classics. Is because the the biggest, you know, thing that a film must do. Uh, it's not box office. It's not pleasing the fans. It's 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 resisting time. You know, like is it still relevant in 50 years and 100 years? And I, I mean, I can't I can't believe that that uh, that it, when they shot. Back to the Future that they shot like half the movie with Eric Stoltz 
as mm-hmm. the main guy and then they just stopped and they just like yeah we're gonna have to recast this and we're gonna shoot everything again like i can't even comprehend that in a studio project but i think if it wasn't for someone like spielberg backing zemeckis at that time because he they, i mean how much did that cost that must have cost millions yeah. And it's not a, sc- a scenario that you would see nowadays. Like no. it's not, and it, and it's not a movie that would be produced nowadays. And no, it, no. It makes me not sad sometimes that that no, not by studios. And it it saddens me sometimes to see that some of the best movies that were ever produced wouldn't get made today because yeah. people are afraid of risks. And even Back to the Future back in the days was super hard to get off the ground. It got through, the script was refused forty times. Everybody, Everybody yeah. Uh, Disney so Disney it, said like, "There's incest." Like. The, 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 <laughs> exactly. So that, that's what, that's another proof that you need to like the, the the two creators were like, no, we're gonna get this made. You know, Gail and the two Bobs. You know, they, they were fighting for it and they got it made. But I, I think it's an inspiration for for everyone. You know that uh, you, you need to fight and there is still a uh, place for original voices. But what saddens me is is nowadays like it's all about sequels. It's all about uh, uh, let's, let's IP, remake that comic great books, yeah. movie that 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 worked 30 years ago. Let's like let's do a, a 98 Star Wars because you know and and um, you know it's uh, I think there should there should definitely be room for that. I'm not saying those movies shouldn't get made, but please leave some room for the new because one of the things that cinema has proven is that it's the the the, the new or original ideas that people are like, wow, I, this I like, you know, this I'm excited about. I, I, back in the 80s, we were surprised by movies. Every, every, every weekend, there was something Ghostbusters, Back to the Future, Goonies, yeah. Gremlins, like Indiana yeah. Jones. It was just constant, constant originality. And they were taking risks that yeah. would never in a million years get done today. Um, can you imagine Goonies today? No. Like, there's no. just no way. That's a Disney, that's like a Disney Plus you know, three or four million dollar movie if you're lucky. <laughs> yeah, but 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 people do uh, Stranger Things and they allude to those movies all the time because they were good back in the days and they try to recapture this magic, which I understand. But you know, like um, yeah, I wish there was more room for original. And I I, I stick to my ideas. You know, like I I, I want to make original films that people have never seen before. That's what right. drives me to. To do it, you know, and and to do it on a budget now because we don't have the the endless pocketbook that the that our our ancestors, our cinematic ancestors had. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Um, now, where can uh, where can people find you and your work? Um, I'm everywhere. I'm, I'm I'm you know I'm on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on IMDb. I'm on Vimeo. Uh, Martin Villeneuve. I'm very easy to find, and I encourage you to to see my TED talk if you haven't seen it yes. because that's what. You know, I think it's a nice little introduction, 10 minutes. It's not long, you know, as every TED Talk is. And then you can have a link to my, my movie underneath, thank God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like uh, you can watch my shorts, you can Vimeo, you can watch uh, my advertising work, and my, my latest demo reel, everything is there. I'm very easy to find. Fantastic. I'll put all of that in the show notes. Thank you. Martin, thank you so much for being on the show, my friend. It's You are truly an inspiration. So thank you again for fighting the good fight. Uh, the creative fight and uh, and keep and keep doing what you're doing, my friend. Well, thank you so much, Alex. I appreciate you.